As you might remember from Unit 1, Professor Gen drew our attention to the idea of common law. Professor Gen discussed the common law in its historical context. I want to pick up on some of these themes at this point and draw our attention back to the idea of common law. Now, I think we have to stress that we can use the term common law in a number of different contexts. It means something slightly different in each context. First of all, then, we can make a distinction between common law and statute. I don't want to say anything about this in detail at this point, as I will pick up on it uh, in a later lecture. We can also make a distinction between common law and equity. Now, I do want to talk about this distinction, but there is another important distinction that I will mention first and discuss first before turning to the distinction between common law and equity. And the distinction that I want to uh, mention and look at in a little detail is the distinction between common law and civil law. Now, let me spend a little bit of time on this before turning to common law and equity. If we make a distinction between common law and civil law, we're actually really making a distinction between what we could call two different legal families. Now, the history of common law, as you are aware, is related and linked to the history of the United Kingdom. Common law develops distinctly in a different way from civil law, which tends to be associated with traditions of European legal thinking. I think one can make too, a mistake in stressing too hard and fast a difference between common law and civil law, because they are, uh, although they have their differences, their distinctions, there are ideas certainly moving between civil law and uh, common law, especially if one goes back to the uh, past of civil law, which is Roman law. Roman law has uh, a massive influence on common law. In fact, the terms that we use, for instance, uh, the term res or rem, which means uh, property, is, uh, or things strictly, we use it in the law of property, um, is drawn from uh, Latin. It's a Latin term, it's drawn from Roman law. Civil law has a strong relationship to Roman law. The common law, by virtue perhaps of its, um, its island home, um, has this distinction from the civil law. It's a different kind of historical development. But we could push it further than this. Civil law and common law, most commentators, most people uh, writing about these different legal traditions, would make a number of distinctions that I just want to briefly draw our attention to. One way of illustrating this distinction, and I stress that this is really a, a snapshot view of uh, this, this matter, is a statement from Chief Justice Shaw. It's actually an American case, but that needn't worry us too much at the moment. Uh, called Norway Plains and Boston and Main Railroad. And it's uh, Lord Justi Chief Justice Shaw talking about the nature of the common law. And then I want to just uh, compare what Chief Justice Shaw says um, to an understanding of civil law and the civil law tradition. So this is the quote from Chief Justice Shaw. It's one of the great merits and advantages of the common law that instead of a series of detailed practical rules established by positive provisions and adapted to the precise circumstances of particular cases, which would become obsolete and fail when the practice and course of business to which they apply should cease or change, the common law consists of a few broad and comprehensive principles founded on reason, natural justice and enlightened public policy. So what Chief Justice Shaw is drawing our attention to here is that the common law, he characterises the common law as consisting of a series of um, uh, practical principles which are informed by certain values. And he's comparing this to essentially um, a code, in other words, the fundamental idea behind civil law. Now, for instance, if we look at the French legal tradition, it's based on the Napoleonic code. The code is central to the law and cases serve to, if you like, um, elaborate the fundamental principles of the code. If we go back to what Chief Justice Shaw is saying, then in common law, we obviously don't have this reference to a fundamental code. We have this more, well, in Chief Justice Shaw's opinion, more uh, pragmatic, practical, possibly even flexible development of legal principles on a case-by-case -case basis. This, of course, would take us back to thinking about the development of precedent. The... <laughs> I don't really want to say, well, look, we can sketch out advantages and disadvantages of these two traditions. I think that's too uh, simplistic. As I say, I think it's probably more correct to see them as influencing each other 
uh, as going back to fundamental Roman law concepts. And I think there has been um, an on-running debate, which is probably about a thousand years old, um, perhaps a little less, of the different ways in which civil law and common law work. Now, the whole point of this discussion really is just to stress that we're here talking about legal families. And I suppose like any family, there are shared relations. So civil law and common law are different ways of doing law, different national traditions, different uh, supranational traditions. There are different claims by, made by lawyers and commentators within each tradition, but we can perhaps see them as um, emphasising the way that principles and rules work in slightly different ways, with civil law stressing a code, with uh, precedent forming uh, a rather limited part, although there are differences between different European uh, civilian traditions, and the common law where binding precedent is much more fundamental and there is no underlying code. That would be then the fundamental distinction between common law as a legal family and civil law. The point that I want to turn my attention to now though is another distinction, the distinction between common law and equity. The best way into this distinction is first of all primarily I think historical and institutional. And again, I want to just refresh your memory of certain themes that Professor Gen was talking about. We need to go back in time to understand the historical roots, and the institutional roots of the distinction between common law and equity, or in other words, the distinction between the common law and equitable courts, or in other words, the distinction between common law and equitable principles. We need to go back in time to the medieval period. In fact, to the reign of Edward I, so the 1200s and the very early 1300s. Now, I said a moment ago that this distinction is institutional. The distinction between equity and common law is institutional. It relates to institutions. And this is one way, I think, of hanging on to the following point. Certain courts of law we could call common law courts. They enforce the common law. Over time, historically, and as I say, if we go back to uh, the early medieval period, um, the common law courts developed various uh, writs or causes of action, technical terms, which would allow people to obtain remedies for various wrongs that they had suffered. So you would go to a common law court, you would say, I've been wronged, you would uh, serve a writ on the court, and the court would hopefully give you a remedy. Now, it begs the obvious question. What would happen if the common law court didn't give you a remedy? In other words, if a writ, a cause of action, didn't exist? Well, one way round this, and again, this developed as a historical practice, would be to petition the king. Why the king? Well, the king in the feudal system, in the medieval system, is the font of justice. So if one cannot not obtain justice in the common law courts, one would essentially petition the king, requiring the king or requesting the king to grant you justice. Now, the king tended to delegate this uh, function, i.e. hearing petitions, to the Lord Chancellor. Now, the Lord Chancellor was a member of the, what was called the King's Council. During the reign of Edward II, so we're now in the mid-14th century, these are practices that develop uh, over uh, quite a time frame, as you might be aware, the Lord Chancellor began to formalise the way in which he heard pleas. So legal historians who've studied these matters would date the beginnings of the Court of Chancery, in other words, an equitable court linked to the Lord Chancellor, body presided over by the Lord Chancellor, to this very period, to the 14th century. Although it was not until somewhat later, under the reign of Richard II, that we could perhaps really properly speak of the Court of Chancery coming into its own as a distinct court. So the fundamental ideas that we've got here is that equity, the roots of equity are historical. They lie in the limitations of the courts of common law, not recognising certain writs, certain causes of action. And a historical practice that really begins with the king delegating the hearing of petitions to the Lord Chancellor, and the Lord Chancellor over time, different Lord Chancellors, developing the, the role of the Court of Chancery, which hears these pleas. In other words, hears pleas for remedies which the common law courts can't grant. Now, these are complex matters, so I want to really do it, um, illustrate what I'm talking about by means of an example. There's a little bit of backstory that I need to tell you, and that relates to the Lord Chancellor. Now, the Lord Chancellor was educated in canon law, the law of the Christian church. In other words, not strictly the common law, different set of principles. The body of principles, the, the, the theological knowledge, if you like, that the Lord Chancellor would bring to the hearing 
of these petitions. Would this, uh, this was influenced by certain principles that one finds in ecclesiastical law, law of the Christian church, rather than in the body of common law. Now, what's also perhaps interesting to bear in mind here is that certain scholars have argued that there is, in fact, an influence of Islamic law on the development of equity, in particular the next concept that I'm going to talk about, which is a concept, a legal vehicle, a legal relationship, developed exclusively by the Court of Chancery, and that is the trust. Um, legal scholars have argued that the trust is related to a concept in Islamic law called the wakfa. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but it would suggest again that rather than seeing legal traditions as, as linked, uh, as delinked from other legal traditions, what we're seeing is, is mutual influence. So the trust. Let me try and explain the trust. The key concept lying behind the trust, and indeed a key concept for equity, is the idea of conscience. Now, conscience is, of course, a moral term, isn't it? One can talk of being bound in conscience. For instance, if you make a promise, I might say that you are bound in conscience to keep that promise. We can clearly see that the idea of conscience is both uh, a moral term and, in a sense, a term that relates to certain religious or theological ideas. So I think it's fair to say that conscience and the role that conscience plays in equity suggests these historical roots. If we look at the modern law of equity, I think these uh, ideas are still there, but I don't think I would make any claim, if you like, to their theological provenance uh, in uh, contemporary terms. But let me just try and illustrate how conscience works in the court of equity and how it links to the idea of the trust, which, as I've said, is particular to the court of chancery. It's an equitable idea. And again, let me try and do this by virtue of an example. So let's pretend we're back in the medieval times and let's um, uh, try and recreate some of the historical context. Let's say I'm going off on a crusade. I'm a, a rich landowner. Owner. I'm going off on a crusade. Whilst I'm off on the crusade, and who knows if I'll come back or not, I want uh, my lands, my estates, to be looked after uh, on behalf of my family. So I say to my best friend, let's say my best friend is called uh, T. Uh, I say to T, look, I'm going away for a while. I want you to look after my property, but I want you to be looking after it on behalf of my family. I want them to have the benefit of the rents of the fields or what have you. So I'm off then, I disappear. Let's say I'm gone for 10 years. During this time, T is legally in charge of my land. We could say that, Lee, uh, that T has control of my land, uh, T has legal title to my land. What happens, let's say, if T decides to keep that land for himself? Remember I said to him, you're looking after this land on behalf of my family. But T proves to be a false friend and keeps the land for himself. Now, obviously, I would be somewhat upset by that, as indeed would my family. The trouble is, and this goes back to the story I was telling a moment ago, if my family go to, the, the, to a common law court and say, T has taken this land, the common law court says, well, wait a minute, T had control of that land. T is the owner of that land. What are you talking about? Now, this is clearly a problem, isn't it? And this would be one of the petitions that might end up before the Lord Chancellor. So how would the Lord Chancellor deal with this? Clearly, if T has made a promise to me that he is looking after my land on behalf of my family, T is bound in conscience to look after that land and not to claim it as his own. In other words, the equitable courts, using the idea of conscience, begin to develop a legal relationship, which we would call the relationship of trust, which the common law courts simply couldn't understand. At common law, you either own something or you don't own something. At equity, you can own something to the extent that you are looking after it on behalf of somebody else. And let's say that those people for whom you are looking after the property are the beneficiaries. In other words, the language develops of trustee and beneficiary. The beneficiaries have certain equitable rights against the trustee to allow the trustee to enforce that trust. And I'm hoping that you can appreciate that lying behind all these ideas is the idea of conscience. In other words, the conscience of the trustee, the person uh, who has said that he will look after that property for the beneficiary. It would be wrong, would it not, for that trustee to claim the, the land as his or her own. That's largely a historical sketch. And the last thing that I want to do is try and return to that point and build it, if you like, in relation to how these ideas might work in contemporary law, in modern law. Now, as I said, I think it would be wrong to say that the idea of conscience, the principle of conscience in Modern equity is uh, directly traceable back to a theological or a moral idea, but these ideas perhaps retain some kind of presence within the law.
Let's imagine the following set of facts, and these facts are drawn from a case, a modern case, called Lloyd Bank, Lloyd's Bank and Rossett. Facts of this case were as follows. Uh, two people who were married to each other uh, moved into uh, a derelict farmhouse, which they were going to, uh, to do up, spend money and time on, uh, renovate this, this property. The uh, husband um, inherited some money, uh, and both the title to this property and the mortgage were put into the husband's name. In other words, he is the legal owner of that property. Now, during the course of their time in this property, the non-owning spouse, the wife, did quite a lot of work doing the property up whilst the husband paid off the mortgage. Now, here's the problem. Two people have moved in together. Let's forget the divorce, the ultimately divorce, but that's not my concern in, in discussing these facts. It's to say, what is the relationship between a property owner, who as far as the common law is concerned, owns the property, has title to the property, and somebody else who, for instance, does work on that property? Do they have a share in that property which relates to the value of their work, let's say? So this is the issue. Now, the facts of Lloyd's Bank and Rossett are rather complicated, but let me cut to the chase and say that, well, in, to my, uh, uh, in my opinion, unfortunately, Mrs. Rossett, when the relationship broke down, ultimately got no share in the property. But it begs the, 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 the way the case was decided, came up with the following test, which would allow us to resolve this problem using the law of equity. In other words, how would a non-property owning spouse, or indeed a cohabitee, make some kind of claim over property to which they were not the legal owner. The fundamental idea in Lloyds Bank and Rossett is if the property owning spouse promises, or at least makes a representation that seems like a promise to the non-property owning spouse, then it may be the case that on the basis of that representation, that promise, if you like, the non-property owning spouse could claim a share of that property which relates to the agreement. So on the following facts. Let's say I move in with my girlfriend and I say, I'm the legal owner of the property. I say to my girlfriend, you can have a share in this property if you help me with the renovations. And let's say that the share of the renovations that my girlfriend does amounts to £20,000 worth uh, of, of value. Let's say our relationship sadly falls apart and the question uh, rises, what interest does my spouse, my uh, cohabitee, my girlfriend have over the property. Now looked at from the point of view of law, I am the legal owner. In other words, she has no interest at all. Looked at from the point of view of the test in Lloyds Bank and Rossett, we'd have to look and see if there was an agreement that we had made, a promise if you like, that I had made to my girlfriend, which on the facts there is, that you can have a share in my property to the value of the work that you have done upon it. Now this would be an example of equity operating through the idea of conscience and giving the non-property owning spouse, the girlfriend in the example, an interest in my property. Now, I can't really explain to you in detail technically how that happens, but we could see, couldn't we, that this is based on my promise, it's based on my representation to my girlfriend, that she has a share in that property. And it would be wrong, would it not, for me to renege on that promise, or for me not to be held by the law to that promise. In other words, what we can see here is an example of the modern law of equity, dealing with a modern problem. Problem, let's say, of uh, two cohabitees um, and their relation, the, the, the question of the shares they own in property. This contemporary problem, we can see that that principle of equity, which is based on conscience, gives the non-property owning spouse an interest in that property. I think this is an example that takes us away, obviously, from the medieval world that we started with and shows how those historical concepts are reinterpreted and used again in the context of the modern world.